Now then, how are you doing? I hope you're well. Here's a question. Where do your ideas for paintings mostly come from? Do you generate them or wait for them to come to you? Are those ideas directly inspired by what's around you or are they conjured up purely from imagination? Or maybe it's a combination of the two. Well, in this short video, I want to explore a few ideas and processes of my own and demonstrate how those ideas might develop on the paper. Well, much of my own primary inspiration comes from things I see when I'm out walking. And there's always a lot to see, providing you keep your eyes open and your mind open to the possibilities. So let's take a look at some of the things that I observed and the paintings and sketches they inspired on a recent trip out. My main tried and trusted method of generating fresh ideas is to go for a walk. I always seem to manage to find inspiration when I'm walking alongside a river. Nature has its own way of carving out shapes, lines and colours that are both unique and attractive. Not only am I attracted to the warm colours of the river, something that only seems to happen in a certain light, but I'm also captivated by the distinctive tapering shape of it as it flows away from me. What I'm noticing is that the trees that line the far bank are effectively mirroring that shape. The two elements together are helping to draw the eye in and take us on a visual journey. In this quick watercolour sketch, I want to keep things as simple as possible. I've painted the trees wet in wet with bright, vibrant colours to match the warmth of the river, all of which is balanced by the cooler colours and darker tones of the foreground rocks and the overhanging foliage. It's easy to become overwhelmed by the many details in a potential scene. Details that become ever more complex the longer you study them. Always try to reduce things down to their core components. If necessary, squint at it or take your glasses off if you wear glasses and try to focus on just the simple shapes, tones and colours. Once you've established those simple shapes, you can then start to build up from there. As I walk, so the landscape around me changes. The beauty of this is the landscape is full of surprises. To the artist, this is a good thing, providing we're prepared to go along with whatever comes our way and not be too fixed in our ideas. Be surprised by the sudden change in light. Be surprised by what's just over the hill. One of the primary cornerstones of landscape art is observation. Keep your eyes open and use them. What do you see? More importantly, later on in the day when you're relaxing, pottering around at home or festering on the couch, what do you remember? Those flashes of memory are important. Try to capture them and file them away for later use. 
some of the most powerful paintings can come from just the seed of an idea. And that idea might just spring from a single brief memory. Allow yourself to be seduced by the landscape. Or maybe it's just me, but I'm eternally fascinated by the arrangement of fields and their boundaries. The distribution of trees. Were they planted like that or have they simply always been there? They group together conspiratorially as if plotting something, dominated or herded by the older, larger trees perhaps. Crucially, it's worth noting that trees and field boundaries not only follow but help to visually explain the contours of the ground. Be sure to use them to give three-dimensionality to your landscapes. One of my favourite exercises is to produce a painting using a single colour, often referred to as a tonal study. It's an exercise that we should all indulge in from time to time, no matter how long we've been painting, to remind ourselves of the importance of value in a subject. My colour of choice for this is Payne's Grey, but you can just as easily use any colour that has a suitably broad tonal range. Sepia is a traditional choice, for example. It's basically a one-pot painting, and relieved from the restraints of colour mixing, working with a single colour can be surprisingly liberating. The ultimate success or failure of a tonal study will hang entirely upon the carefully considered distribution of contrasting tones. Place two objects of the same or similar value right alongside each other, for instance, and it would be difficult to differentiate between them. If necessary, we can exaggerate or engineer our tones in order to maintain good, clear definition. If a potential scene sufficiently catches your eye in the same way that this one caught mine, then it might be worth your while contemplating how many different ways it might be manipulated. It could be stretched cropped, turned into a snow scene, or a moonlit scene perhaps. If the mood takes you, it could be made excessively stormy, or perhaps turned into a misty sunrise. Sometimes, if I've been working with a lot of greens, I'll mix myself up some warm colours and throw them at the paper just to get some balance into my artistic life. Experimentation should be fun. Use your original source material as a starting point, but then do your own thing with it. Try following your heart, not your head. If you want to move things around or create your own mood, then go for it. It's your interpretation and let no one tell you otherwise. Never let the truth get in the way of a good composition. Always be prepared to capitalise on chance encounters. I paused by the historic late 17th century Down Home Bridge, marvelling at its impressive architecture and enjoying the fast flowing river. To be honest, I was ready for a short break from walking and a sandwich. When this fisherman walked into view beyond the arches, I know absolutely nothing about fly fishing, and I'm not even sure he knew that I was there. His deep concentration on the job at hand was only matched by his top-notch two-tone waders and fishing vest, not to mention the cool-looking sunglasses. I'm not big on painting people, but this felt like a sketch that simply had to happen whatever the outcome. With figures, proportions are probably the most important aspect to get right. 
always remember the human body is roughly seven heads tall and it's important not to make the head too big posture is important too although this fisherman was stood so still that i wouldn't have been surprised if he'd whipped out a long wooden pole and speared the fish like a stealthy amazonian warrior i've tried to keep the clothing muted with a range of natural looking greens nothing too jangly and in case you're wondering a good starting point for flesh colour is raw sienna and alizarin crimson. Chance encounters come in all shapes and sizes. These sheep were as inquisitive as I was. And these skittish cows kept hurtling themselves around the field in a slightly worrying, mildly aggressive fashion. When drawing any animal, I find it's best to start by getting the basic outlines established as soon as possible. Cows are generally quite rectangular in shape and their hides always seem solid and muscular. These were Jersey cows, not black and white Frisians, so I had to find a suitable colour I settled on a mix of raw sienna, burnt umber and cadmium red. Some were black, also jerseys I'm guessing, although I could be wrong about that. Black animals can be tricky, but can generally, as with all subjects, be broken down into light and dark values. Try to identify the lightest colour first and use that as your starting point. In this case, where the light is hitting the top of the animal, it appears as a light grey, which I've mixed from French ultramarine and burnt umber. Never underestimate the surprise encounter. No matter how much we plan a walking trip, no matter what subjects we've decided we're going to be on the lookout for when we start out, it's often those unexpected moments that raise the bar and make it a little more extraordinary than expected and memorable. Good, keen observation is paramount then, if we are to absorb our surroundings and come up with fresh ideas for paintings. My final tip is this, when you do come across something that inspires you and triggers wholesome ideas of an artistic nature, don't take that subject at face value or become fixated on one viewpoint. Try to look at it from as many different angles as possible. Take this cairn, often referred to as White Cairn, on the coast-to-coast -coast long distance route a few miles outside of Richmond. The cairn stands alone but dominates its immediate surroundings and is just waiting to be sketched or painted. But which angle is best, with the valley in the background or the rocky scar? What about the thistles in the foreground? Because I love the patchwork of fields and trees so much, that was the viewpoint I opted for. I started with an all over wet in wet wash and then lifted out the shape of the cairn with a piece of tissue. Masking fluid would do the job just as well or better, but I rather like the spontaneity of lifting out. The cairn itself was painted with varying degrees of grey, mixed from French ultramarine and burnt umber. In watercolour, we work from light to dark, 
So the finishing touches were always going to be the dark gaps between the stones. My final example is this idyllic little church, complete with graveyard. In fact, it's exactly that, idyllic. It was also a bit of a surprise since I had no idea it was there, despite having driven past it on the nearby road hundreds of times, totally oblivious. But which view sets it off best of all? Remember, don't take anything at face value. Walk around it, up to it, away from it, and in the case of an interesting building like this, take the time to walk all the way around it and try to avoid fixating on one particular viewpoint too early on. Once I'd drawn the scene out in pencil, I proceeded to apply a wet in wet wash for the sky and adjacent trees and hills. I deliberately left a couple of light areas in the sky where I could add some blue patches after it had dried. For this, I used Prussian blue. Applying it to dry paper meant that I could create some subtle edges to the clouds. If you're going to do this though, it's vitally important not to make the blue darker in tone than the darkest part of the rest of the sky. If you do that, it'll look terrible. For the stonework on the church, I used various greys mixed mostly from French ultramarine and burnt umber, but with a small amount of alizarin crimson added and extra burnt umber here and there to hopefully keep it visually interesting. I always think it's better to suggest stonework than try to put every little detail in. Always try to leave something for the viewer to interpret by themselves. They'll thank you for it in the end. Notice how important contrasts are to the composition. Like the tonal study I did earlier, irrespective of the colours used, well placed properly distributed contrasting values are crucial to the success of any watercolour painting, whatever the subject. So there you have it, a whole bunch of ideas and potential subjects from a single walk out, and a smattering of handy hints that may help you to generate and develop new painting ideas of your own. Maybe. I always recommend keeping things as simple as possible. Try to reduce things down to their basic forms, and also try to think tonally. And no matter how much you plan in advance, it's almost always the unexpected things that generate the most interest. Always allow yourself to be surprised and be prepared to exploit any chance encounters. Well, finally, don't always go with your first thought. Look at your subject from as many different angles as you can. More importantly, don't be afraid to experiment. Have a bit of fun with it. It's allowed, you know. 
Well, most of the paintings featured in this video will be available as full-length demonstrations and supported projects to subscribers of my online student service. Well, details of how to sign up to that and the appropriate links can be found in the description below. Until next time, take care.